watch the spotlight change as I walk. Ah. <laughs> She's on the ball. Oh, they are on the ball. Excellent job. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Keith. Um, if the talk gets boring, I might just do some more jumping jacks and we'll see how we go. Uh, Keith and Mario's Guide to Continuous Deployment. Um, it says Keith and Mario's Guide. Uh, the keen observer in you would notice that there was only one of me. This is Mario. Uh, he could make it. Uh, he's stuck in Melbourne, um, but he couldn't make the conference. But you could all send in some heart emojis on Twitter. I should have put his handle up there, but it's uh, Mario Busick in the bottom right hand corner, so send him some love and it would be great. Uh, so that's Mario, this is me, Keith Pitt. Um, that's my Twitter handle. The, uh, that fluffy thing on the left isn't part of my beard. That's actually um, an animal. Uh, once you get a beard, you start fascinating more about beards. Um, and uh, start looking at other dudes' kids. This guy, his name is uh, Harley. He's from Epic Mill Time. Um, I like his beard a lot, except the outsides are a bit rough for my liking. So I cleaned it up, and I think if that's, I think that's how I would wear the beard. Um, when I rehearsed this, I was under time, so I thought we could just look at some pictures of beards together. Uh, this dude's beard is quite nice. Uh, this is Data from Star Trek. Uh, he can't. He can't wear a beard, um, but this guy can. It's a pretty, it's a lot of, lot of gel in that beard. If you want to know more, I would check out beards.org. Um, it's just the forum, beards. Uh, I like eating apple products. This picture of me, when I'm not growing a beard, this is what I do. Uh, I also got this one. And uh, more information about me. Um, I won South Australian Edition of the Year in 2007. Um, those birds weren't, weren't there when I won. Um, there was the wand that was photoshopped in afterwards. Uh, but um, that's what I did when I won. Uh, Mario and I used to work for a company called Envato. They make theme forest, Cone Canyon, a couple of sites like that. Together we worked on uh, a site called Envato Studio. It was Microlancer. Uh, it helps freelancers sell their digital services online. Um, I work at Pin Payments. Uh, Mara and I also make this thing called Desktop Together. Uh, it's a site that lets you download desktop wallpapers to a Dropbox. So as you scroll through wallpapers, you're like, oh, I like that picture of a cat. You download it, it'll sync to your Dropbox, and then you, hit your, you change your background thing to point to the Dropbox folder, and you hit instant wallpapers. It's magic. Um, uh, plug, I work for Buildbox you now, uh, full time recently. So I've full time on it. It's a continuous integration service, but it's a little different. Uh, all the tooling is hosted, the UI is hosted, but you bring your own build <laughs> service and you get complete control, flexibility, security, you can run it behind your firewall, but you don't have to deal with like Java or Team City installations. Um, and if you go to this link, you get two months free um, of Buildbox, Buildbox.io slash web dot. Anyway, plugs over, let's talk about Australia. Um, uh, I'm from Australia. Uh, it's a little island off the coast of New Zealand. Uh, we say... <laughs> let's just New Zealand this uh, it, we, we, we pronounce it Australia, so this can drop the AU. Um, I'm from the left-hand side of Perth, um, and this is our central business district. Um, <laughs> it's kind of what most of Perth looks like. Um, Plug, another plug, uh, Rails Camp Perth is happening in November 14th, 17th. Um, if you'd like to come, come find me afterwards. Uh, it's pretty much, this is the campsite. Um, uh, we're kind of in the middle. Uh, we've got a climbing wall, we've got some archery, we've got uh, a flying fox with some snorkeling. Uh, we may have some student tickets available. So if you're interested in coming to Rails Camp Perth, come find me afterwards and I'll give you some more details. So. More facts about Australia before I get on to what you're actually here to see. Um, uh, this, this gentleman here, uh, 1954, this is Bob Hawke. He sculled 2.5 pints of beer in 11 seconds. Um, he later became our Prime Minister. <laughs> um, the first police force in Australia was made up of the most well-behaved criminals. 
you're doing less murdering today. Go to the police. Uh, the emu and the kangaroo are on our crest because neither the, of these animals can walk backwards. So they can't pull off the little stand sign. Uh, the average Australian will consume 165,000 eggs in their lifetime. Yeah. It's very interesting, I know. And uh, Australian billionaire politician Clive Palmer wants to build a new Titanic, a replica. We call it Titanic 2. <laughs> Just, no, this, 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 these are not jokes. These are 100%, no, no, they're actually serious facts. Um, you can Google Clive Palmer, he's a politician. All right, everyone. <laughs> everyone put your hands up for me, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. much. All right, put your hands, don't put your hands down yet. I didn't say anything. Thank you. Put your hands down if you don't write tests. It's okay to put your hands down. I won't shame you much. It's okay. Put, okay, put your hands down if you don't have a CI server. Oh. Put your hands down if you don't automatically push your master branch to production on successful builds. Who's got the hand up? Ah, oh, no. oh, yeah. You, high five. High five the guy next to you because he had his hand up. State? Uh, no. It does not count, unfortunately. It's just, just production. Um, so, a few people do it, and uh, you may have heard the terms continuous delivery, continuous deployment. They are different, and, and it's easy to get confused between the two. In continuous delivery, testing is automated, but the deployed production is manual. In continuous deployment, the entire pipeline is automated, including the deployed production. So, you might be asking yourself, what is this continuous deployment voodoo you speak of, Keith, and why would I want to do it? Well, because of YOLO. Well, well, not really YOLO. The, the process is pretty YOLO, um, but the, the code is not. I found when I was doing continuous deployment, I would be writing a, some code, and I would knew that in about 10 minutes' time, this code would be on production. So I, I really changed how I approached particular problems. I was much more careful in what I did. I was much more thorough in what I was trying to achieve. Uh, I wasn't just throwing some code out there and... Like, when, whoever deploys that next week, it's going to be their problem to deal with because I know it's not going to work. Um, deployments are tied to my name. So Keith pushed this, it went to production, and now he's deleted all the users. So I, I tend to be much more careful in the way that I approach problems. Um, there are three, three qualities of continuous deployment that I say are important. One of them is fast feedback. We want deploys to be fast in this new world of A-B testing and those other things that require fast deployments. Um, you, want, you, want, you want fast feedback from your production environment. Um, so con doing continuous deployment makes that work because your entire process is automated. You commit, you push, time passes, production. And there's really no human involvement. You're much more confident in your deploys because these things are automated. You've written scripts to handle the entire deployment process. Migrations are handled for you. Testing is handled for you. And if you trust the tests, then you should be able to deploy to production off, off master straight away. Um, and it, I used to do a lot of manual deploys, and manual deploys now scare me because I forget if I'm going to dump, like, a, have I tagged this thing? Have I not tagged it? What's the tagging structure? Like, have I committed this thing to staging right? Have I run the smoke tests? Uh, I've stuffed up a couple of deploys in my time because I'm trying to rush something out and I just forgot to do something. So it gives me the confidence. Um, and it's scalable. If you've got if you're doing maybe one to two deploys to master a day, you can scale up to maybe 30, 30 deploys a day quite easily. Um, and when you commit to master and the deploy goes out, you end up doing much more deploys anyway. So it scales really, really well. Um, I like Venn diagrams. Let's turn this into a Venn diagram. Great. It doesn't really need to be a Venn diagram, but I thought it would, could be one if it was good. Um, uh, and there's another thing there in the middle. So um, <laughs> everyone take a photo of this. Show it to your boss, they'll be instantly convinced that this is a good idea. Um, everyone's got photos? Great. Uh, okay, so continuous deployment. You, the, as the famous saying goes, you can't do continuous deployment without breaking your few omelets. So let's talk about what we're going to need for a continuous deployment. All these things. There's many of them, but they're all very, very easy. Uh, let's get into the first one, which is feature planning. Um, Okay, Monday, you come to work, your, your goal is to make this new feature. 
You should talk with your team about how you're going to uh, write this feature and deploy this feature all in the same uh, conversation. Uh, you talk about what's the smallest thing that you can ship today. Let's say this feature is quite large. Try and break the feature into much smaller features so, and ones that you can ship today. Add this link here, boom. Add this thing here, boom, boom, boom. And by the end of the week, you've done 10 deploys and the feature is complete as what the, the customer originally wanted. Um, uh, but you've got lots of smaller deploys and smaller increments in the code base. Um, can it be deployed with zero downtime? Uh, maybe you're adding a new piece of infrastructure to your production servers. Maybe you're adding Redis or changing databases or something. Uh, you should probably talk about if, uh, does this feature that we're about to embark on have any implications to zero downtime? And we'll learn more about what zero downtime is in a few slides time. And uh, uh, well, how are we going to handle database migrations? Uh, if anyone here has tried continuous deployment before, you know that database migrations are a pain in the bum. So we're going to learn about how to deal with those later on. And you just need to talk about them during uh, those conversations. So code reviews. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Bill Gates using the 1980s version of GitHub. Um, he's just <laughs> looking at looking at just looking at paper. Uh, code review is really important to continuous deployment, and uh, GitHub plays a big part of that. The pull request system is completely amazing. It fundamentally changed how we do code reviews. Um, when Mario would do a feature on desktop, he'll write some code, submit a pull request. I'll plus one it. I'll hit merge when it. Sorry, he hits merge when he's happy and I've plus one it. Um, goes to master, master goes to production, boom. It's very, very simple. Um, uh, but sometimes, uh, oh, actually this is a picture of a pull request of someone adding a flux capacitor to a project. Yeah, that happened. Um, but sometimes PRs can get a little off topic when you're talking about white space or quotes or like hash syntax. So there are a couple of gems to kind of just make those decisions for you. One of them is Kane by Square. Um, it does some static analysis. It uh, looks at line length and it looks at the ABC complexity of your project and, and will error if it doesn't look quite right. And uh, this one here, Rubocop, is a, a robust Ruby code anal analyzer based on the community Ruby style guide. It makes sure that you're using the right hash syntax and you're not doing anything crazy looking. Um, and those two gems will just uh, make the CI process a little bit easier for you. Uh, feature toggles, one of my favorite parts of continuous deployment. Um, the idea behind a feature toggle is just a, a mechanism to flip a feature in production on or off without doing a deploy. Now, how you really do that is up to you. It could be a database table, could be Redis, could be environment rebels. It doesn't really matter. As long as there's no real deploy to production involved. Um, I like to think about feature toggles as just being really ghetto. Um, let's say there's a feature that I want to implement, and to get to that feature, you, you have to go through some button or some link. I will generally just hide the button. Uh, in the feature toggle. I won't really bother about hiding the page or anything like that. If the user finds the page, they found a broken feature. That's great. It's a nice little surprise treasure for them. Um, nice broken feature. Uh, uh, FetLife made this gem called Rollout, which works with Redis. Um, that's how he does feature flippers. This is the one that I use personally. It's very, very simple. You can define groups of users. So I'm going to roll this feature out to developers only or you know this group of users only. Uh, and the other one is... Uh, could flip by PDA. It's a bit more enterprise version. It's a lot more features and it's got a web UI that allow you to control stuff. Uh, with rollout, you have to go onto the production console and do it manually. Automated tests. Um, automated deploys need automated tests. It's just kind of the way it goes. Um, Mario and I write just enough tests to make sure that we trust what we're going to do. Um, there was a fad a while ago to like test everything. We don't really test everything. We test just what we trust. Like, we're not sure about this, let's test this. Um, just because we've embraced YOLO in, in you know, the way that we do our, our processes and not writing, not, not writing tests for everything is a part of that. Um, yeah, some, uh, we also don't write all the tests so we can keep the test fast. Now, I know you're wondering, yes, I just said I write less tests to make them fast. Yeah, I did. Um, uh, but there are other ways to make your tests fast, aside from just not writing them. Um, uh, Corey Haynes did a talk on fast Rails tests. Uh, you can watch that. You can just Google fast tests by Corey Haynes, and he'll show you how to write them fast. Um, uh, another type of test is called a smoke test. Now, the idea behind a smoke test is that it runs on your production server after a deploy. So if you're, um, 
If you're doing a deploy uh, manually, you type cap deploy, you'll watch the output stream by, and then when it finished, you'll generally go to production, hit refresh, great, that's all working. Uh, the smoke test automates that particular process for you. Uh, it can be pretty easy. Um, it can start by just checking to make sure that the name of your product is on the home page. It doesn't have to be too difficult, just something to hit the page or hit your key flows, like maybe it'll go purchase something with a, with a real credit card or maybe it'll, I don't know, sign up. Um, just something to make sure that your main flows in production are working. Uh, the way that we use that, do that is by using Capybara. Um, Capybara makes this really easy because you just give Capybara an endpoint and you start, you know, like click this button, is this link there, that sort of thing. Um, it's even better if you can run those same tests locally against your development machine uh, and on production. So uh, if you're just checking to make sure the name of your product is there, you can run, that, run, this, run these tests locally, point them at your local environment, it'll make sure that they run, and then when we put this script as part of our actual deployment process, uh, it'll also check to make sure that it's on production as well after a deploy. Um, zero downtime deploys. Now these are probably, this is one of the more harder bits of continuous deployment. Um, it's just the act of deploying code to production without a maintenance page. Um, because you, because uh, we're committing to master a lot more, um, every commit to master will cause a deploy to production. That will just mean more deploys to production. Um, and if you've got quite a bit of traffic, seeing this all the time is gonna be uh, annoying for your users. So uh, deploying to production without the users noticing that a deploy ever happened is really important. Um, now if you're on Heroku, uh, you'll notice that after a deploy, the next request is quite slow. Uh, there's a way to fix that using Heroku Labs preboot thing. If you enable this option, uh, your users won't even know that a deploy happened if you don't turn on maintenance. So that's quite a useful thing to, to know. Um, if you want to know how to do zero downtime deploys with Unicorn, there's a great Rousecast about it. Um, just go to Rousecast and search for zero downtime deployments and uh, it'll show you how to do it with Unicorn. Now, database migrations. This is the hardest part of continuous deployment. Um, changing the database while the code is still running is very, very, very tricky. Uh, and, and there are really two ways to do it. The easy way is to use a maintenance page like I told you not to do just before. Um, so the flow would be write some code, push to master, uh, in your deployment script it would turn on the maintenance page, then do the actual deploy to production, then turn off the maintenance page. Um, that's the easy way to do handle database migrations in a zero downtime uh, process, but the hard way is by doing two deploys, and you'll know in a second why it's so hard. So if let's say you're adding a column, this is one of the, one of the more common ways of, so one of the more common things you're doing in a migration. You add a column. You start off by deploying the migration, add a column. Great. And then after that, you deploy the code to use the new column. That's how you would do add, add a column in a zero downtime uh, deployment process. Now, removing a column is actually very, very tricky. So you would have to first remove all the code. If you want to remove a column, you have to remove all the code that uses that column first. Great. Secondly, you include some dirty, dirty hacks. And now you're about to find out why database migrations are very, very tricky. This is me removing the notes column from the users table. This is pretty innocent. I deploy this and I start seeing this everywhere, even though I'm not using the column anymore. Like why is this thing still inserting into the notes column? I do not understand. It's because of active record. Um, when active record boots, it actually uh, looks at all the columns of a table and then has, uh, caches them internally. And when you insert uh, a record, it will use those columns. Um, if you don't provide a value for one of those columns, it will just use nil. So we've We've removed the column from the database. We haven't restarted our unicorn workers. We haven't restarted Rails. It still thinks there's a notes column, and we're gonna get this error like we see now. Um, this is what makes zero down deployments very, very, very tricky. And so the way we solve that is just by hacking active record. We just get it to ignore the notes column. Um, so the process of removing a column with a zero downtime migration is remove the code that uses the column, include the dirty hacks, deploy that code to production, um, with the hacks, deploy the migration that then removes the column, and then remove the dirty hacks. That's, that's a real pain, but that's the way that you remove a column with zero downtime. Um, there's a great article by Pedro, Pedro Bello, and he'll uh, you know, show you how to, uh, it goes through every single migration type, 
and it will show you how to do it with zero downtime. Uh, also beware of database locking. If you add an index to a table in MySQL, uh, there is a good chance that the table will lock. Um, and if you're adding a table to your user's table or your sales table, and those tables lock, then in production, no one's going to be able to write to those tables for the period that it takes to run, like add the index. So if your adding index takes 10, 10 minutes, if you've got a lot of data, then you've just completely broken signups and purchases for 10 minutes. Um, you can use the large Hadron Migrator gem from SoundCloud, that'll show you how to do that. Um, that'll show you how to set that all up. Now, in production, uh, stuff sometimes breaks. Uh, and so, you re rolling that back deploys is a very important part of continuous deployment. Um, stuff catches on fire occasionally. Uh, servers catch on fire. You know, people's wallets catch on fire. Stuff of it, I'm sorry, Aaron, should I do it again? Stuff catches on fire sometimes. <laughs> Service catches on fire. Sometimes things catch on fire. And so what I do when stuff catches on fire is uh, I generally just try and roll forward. Um, I don't freak out too much about it because I know I'm going to make a mistake eventually. So uh, what I tend to do is I... Um, uh, the first thing I do is just turn the feature off. Because we've used a feature flag, it's a very, very small deploy. If we've introduced a bug into this feature, and we think, ah, oh, crap, this is not what we wanted, I'll just turn the feature off, go back to the code base, fix it, deploy again, turn the feature on, and I hope that it works. Um, another way to do it is just to git revert, and then git revert, commit to master, automatically deploys to production again. You've essentially just rolled back a commit. Um, uh, GitHub have made this really easy recently with the revert button on pull requests. I'm not sure if you've seen that, but you can merge um, a pull request and revert that particular merge commit in the UI, so you can roll back a deploy um, from GitHub. And the great thing about GitHub is that if you use pull request, the merge pull request button actually becomes your deploy to production button. It's very, very, very cool. Um, and in the bare rules worst case scenario, you can always just turn on the maintenance page. Um, <laughs> even though I'm telling you not to do it, you can always do it if you really screw up a deploy. Um, so you can always just do that. Uh, now, monitoring is really, really important. Uh, you want to know someone's looking at your stuff when you're not. And so um, exception tracking is, is very, very important. I'm going to assume that you're all doing that already. Um, uh, performance monitoring with New Relic is for, oh, sorry. Uh, this is bug snag. This is my favorite bug tracker. Um, I don't wait for them. I don't really know them, but I just like it a lot. Um, uh, performance monitoring is very, very good with New Relic. And uh, um, you can also do business metric monitoring as well. Um, so instead of looking at how fast a request takes, you can start looking at things like sales per minute. Um, and those are very interesting stats to monitor. So if you do a deploy and there's a change in your sales or signups, maybe they've dropped by 5% after this deploy, you may have introduced a bug and not know it. Um, and PagerDuty makes it really easy to get notified. You can plug all those services into PagerDuty. So if you're, so you do a deploy, so you commit to master, automatically gets deployed to production, you go to lunch, and then you get a phone call because you've just introduced a bug. Um, it's, it's pretty powerful, right, then, but lunch would be kind of stuffed. Um, so these are all the ingredients we need for continuous deployment. Those are all the things we're going to need. So let's mix all these ingredients and I'll tell you a story about how I use continuous deployment to make a feature. Um, this, is, this is my current deploy to production script. Um, I don't do anything. I just push to master on Heroku. Um, this is probably the most YOLO way of doing continuous deployment. I wouldn't recommend doing this, but this is really good for Rails Rumble. Um, Next thing we're going to add to our deployment script is running the quality checks using Kane and Rubocop. We're going to, sorry, Rubocop. We're going to run our tests. We're going to push to production, and we're going to run our smoke tests that I told you about before. Uh, now this is even more safer, but to make our deployment script even better, we're going to push the staging first. So we run the quality tests. We run our actual unit tests. We push to staging. We run our smoke tests on staging. We push to production, then run our smoke tests on production. Um, and I think that's a pretty good deploy to production script. Um, and if we mix these, and if we take that deploy script, take all our ingredients, and uh, uh, I'll tell you the story. This is me at a conference. I had a great idea. Uh, social links, social buttons, are very popular these days. I wanted to add them to my side project desktopper. Uh, so I did some code locally. This is what I come up with. Um, we've got Twitter, we've got Google, we've got Facebook, and we've got two LinkedIn buttons. Um, just for that extra, extra business wallpaper sharing. Um, 
uh, those recruiters need wallpapers too. Uh, so I was pretty happy with this particular feature. It was great. I pushed it to a branch and then created a pull request. This is Mario. He's very busy working or reading a book of ponies in the bottom. Um, <laughs> he's, he's pretending to work, but I know what he's doing. Um, I submit the pull request. Uh, I usually include a GIF with all my pull requests. It's, it's part of continuous deployment that GIFs are included with all pull requests. Um, so that's, that's the GIF that I chose. Um, Mario was pretty happy with it. Uh, he tested it locally, and I'm sure that it worked fine. So... <laughs> <laughs> Ignore that. That was, a, that was a separate project, I'm sure. Um, so he's happy with it. I'm happy with it. He's plus one the pull request. I hit the merge pull request button, which is now now new, which is our new deploy to production button. Um, this script runs, and um, uh, what was this plug billbox would say maybe do it for you. Um, uh, it would do the specs, deploy to staging, staging smoke test, production production smoke tests, and if all those things are green, then desktop goes to production and nothing looks any different. No one knows I've deployed, no one knows anything's changed. Because I use feature flags, I turn on the feature flag for developers only. With rollout, you can scope to particular groups of users. I've scoped it to developers only. I then uh, turn it on. This looks great. It's exactly what I expected. Um, I'm happy with the feature now. I'm gonna then turn it on for all of the users, and then boom. We've both achieved continuous deployment, and <laughs> that's, that's a nice gear for you. Yeah, one, more, one more time. Wait, wait. Uh, you, know, you know how hard it is to do? It's, it's actually very tricky because you need to look at the camera and do it. No. Anyway, so you're welcome. Um, uh, so we've, uh, we've got our three things. We've got fast feedback, confidence, scalability. Have we achieved them? Yes, we have. We've got the, the, fast, the fast tests. We've got, um, you can actually make your deploys much faster, by the way, by only doing things that have changed. Um, one thing I didn't cover, but I, uh, I didn't have time to, was um, in your deploy process, it's generally push code to production, bundle, run migrations, and then um, restart. If you haven't changed, uh, you've also got asset compilation. Uh, you can actually change your deploy script, so uh, only do the asset compilation if the assets have changed. Only bundle if bundle has changed. Um, the deploy script for one of our side projects takes a second to get code to production, just because it doesn't really do anything. And that's essentially to production and get pulls and just restarts Unicorn. Um, and those fast deploys are very, very cool. So we've got that. We've got the confidence because everything is automated. All of, we've got scripts that handle everything. We've got monitoring in place. And the solution is scalable. Um, because it's scripted, we don't have to worry about it. We, doing 10 manual deploys a day is going to get really annoying really, really quickly. And because this thing's automated, it's really, really cool. Um, I have some science to show you. Uh, we asked a team that does continuous deployment to uh, give us a git log of, um, and the deployment log for a two-week period. Uh, these are the same size teams, same size project, and uh, this is the results that we got. We found that the uh, team that does continuous deploys actually does five, uh, 4.7 deploys per day, and the uh, other team only does 1.9. And interestingly enough, the changes per deploy were much lower uh, on the other team than it was for the manual deploy team. So uh, there's some more science for you to show your, your manager. Um, so that's kind of it. That's continuous deployment. Um, you should always be continuously deploying. Uh, that's so kind of Mario Mario's motto now. Um, so you should, you should do that. You should it's always be shipping is another motto, but it's not as good as this one. Um, so that's it. Uh, continuous deployment. Keith Mario's guy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Keith, for the great presentation. Um, any questions? Well... It's because I answered it, everything they were going to ask. Um, if not, let me try this. I have a question. Ah, sure. Um, so uh, when, when you were starting to do this uh, continuous deployment process, it was, you know, I assume, an a, a incremental process. Um, did you face any challenges implementing this? Like, were there a lot of things which started breaking when you, when you first uh, tried to do that? Do you have to change your workflow 
in order to accommodate these changes? Yeah, absolutely. So in this particular project we, where we tried this on, we actually started on a greenfield project and we decided to do continuous deployment out of the box. Um, the biggest problem I, I would say we had was actually Heroku. Um, because we're using Heroku, um, it's really hard to run migrations on Heroku. Uh, the migration needs to exist on Heroku before you can run it. Um, and so we had to do two deploys for everything, which, is, uh, which was a real pain. Um, the way that we solved that was actually running, <laughs> I sh shouldn't be telling you this, but I will. Um, we actually downloaded the database URL from Heroku, set it locally, ran the migrations from our machines and put them at production um, so we didn't have to deploy the migration. Um, but uh, there was a lot of pushback from uh, people in the team as well because they haven't really done this sort of thing before. But um, if you ask anyone in the team now, uh, I'm sure they'll swear by it and manual deploys scare them. So uh, that was, yeah, the biggest problem was probably Heroku. How do you coordinate uh, infrastructure changes? Like do you have, if you're on Heroku, I guess not, but maybe you have experience with teams that are using Chef or something like that. Um, how do you well, coordinate with ops if, if you need new infrastructure for a new feature the developers are rolling out? Yeah, so um, this is the process that we use for like most of our commits, like maybe a typo change, maybe we're gonna add a new form. But you've got staging. There's nothing saying that this week we're going to do manual deploys. Um, you've got these scripts. You can run them whenever you like. Uh, a couple of times we said that we're going to turn off auto deploys this week while we work on this big infrastructure thing. Um, so like it's it's this is just a tool. You can t use it however you like. Um, but uh, no, I haven't had any real experience with that sort of thing because we were on Heroku. Um, but I'm, I'm sure it can be done. I see that. Have you ever come across a case where you've had a, a racing deployment? Instead, somebody commits a branch. It's deploying when somebody else merges another pull request. Ah, uh, so yeah, so there's two deploys happening at once. Yeah. Um, yeah, we um at, at the time we were using Travis CI, and I think we only had one worker, so only one build could run at once. So that that's how we solved that problem was the fact that we were going to do one deploy at a time. Um, uh, but um, I'm sure there are other ways to do it with your with Jenkins and Team City. I think you can configure your pipeline steps to be only one of these can run at one time. Um, but yeah, you just only, if you split up the pipeline to multiple steps, you can just control when that step gets run. Um, but in that script that I show you, you would definitely have that problem if um, two deploys run at once. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that a problem that is on Heroku though. So, yeah, are. Hello, after all of this, what do you find to be the most fragile or con continuously fragile part of the process? <sighs> That's a really interesting question. All the fragile bits we, we ironed out. Migrations was tough, but then we figured out how to deal with them, and so they weren't really fragile anymore. Um, the fragility with me would be doing it manually again, because uh, I'd have to look at the script and be like, okay, so we tag it at this point, and we deploy this tag to this one, and there's that tag particular naming scheme. Um, but there's really nothing fragile about it. Like Once you've got those tests in place, and um, all those checks, then it's really, really simple. Um, and, you know, uh, manual deploys scare me much more, um, so not much. Sorry, I'm just saying the same things over and over again, but yeah. <laughs> cool, if there are no other questions, thank you, Keith. Thank you very much.